several members of the Gairai family were obliged to live in Constantinople, so that if the currently ruling Crimean Khan somehow did not justify the trust of Istanbul, they could immediately find a replacement for him. The procedure was simple. If a new hang was needed, one of the sultan's courtiers appeared to the new one chosen by the Turks, handed over a fur coat, a saber and a jeweled hat, after which he read out the order of appointment signed by the sultan personally, and the Khan had to immediately go to the new place of service. The former Khan was supposed, as soon as he found out that he had been dismissed, to immediately abdicate, and go wherever it was more convenient for him. If a shrew came across, the Turkish garrison in the Crimea came into play. The Sultan shuffled the Crimeankins like a deck of cards. According to Shirokarad, during the existence of the Crimean Khanate, 44 kins have been on the throne, ruling 56 times. Some were displaced by the Sultan, and then returned back. Minglajeri II and Kaplangiri underwent this procedure twice. And especially it must be the unlucky El Hajj Selimjeri, and four times at all. That's it. Torida disappears for several hundred years, only the Crimea remains. The Crimean Khanate became an irreconcilable enemy of Russia, as well as Poland and Lithuania, not immediately after the Tatars settled there. The reason is simple. There was a developed feudalism in the yard, and it often does not know irreconcilability. Even if we are talking about peoples with different religions, there are a lot of examples. Few people know, for example, that once the main role in the defeat of the crusaders who moved to the next Turkish sultan was played not by the Turks, but by detachments of quite orthodox Serbs who were in the sultan's service. At first, things were about the same as in the old Russian prince's time with the Polovtsians. Today, the prince and the Khan jointly go on a campaign against one of the neighbors, tomorrow the Khan arranges a raid on the prince, or Prince Nahan. The day after tomorrow, the Khan gives his daughter to the prince, she is baptized, and becomes a faithful devoted wife. However, sometimes this did not prevent the son-in-law and father-in-law from raiding each other again. It was about the same with Crimea. After the transfer of power to the Tatars, not only Italians lived there quite calmly, but also Russians who settled much earlier than them, in considerable numbers. The European traveler Rubruk, who traveled through the northern Crimea in 1253rd year, wrote, Among the steppe people, there are many Cumans, that is, Polovtsians, thanks to the Russians, whose number among them is very large. The same thing is noted by the Arab authors. They are very accurate in describing the lands they traveled through and the peoples they met. El Mafadl. The name of this land is Crimea. It is inhabited by many Cumans of Russians and Alans. Ibnabith Zakir writes about the city of Sudak that it is inhabited by people of different nations, such as Kipchaks, Russians and Alans. As already mentioned, Russian merchants conducted extensive trade with the Crimean Tatars and with Italian cities, and through the Crimea, with the east, and with Constantinople. Some reached the Mediterranean as well. The Tatars did not interfere with them at all, on the contrary, they only encouraged them. The more merchants and goods, the more money in the form of trade duties, settles in the pockets of the Tatars, who cuts the chicken that lays the golden eggs. If you take a short break from the Crimea, it's worth mentioning that the same relationship. Then we were friends, then we were at war with Russia, and with other Muslim states, that arose after the collapse of the Golden Horde. The Kazan throne was sometimes occupied by rulers who were quite pro-Moscow. There is a long list of Kazan, Astrakhan and Crimean nobles who went to serve the Moscow Grand Dukes, and later to the Moscow Tsars. Even much later, when relations with Crimea were reduced exclusively to fierce hostility, the Crimean Tsarevich's Kumar Giri and Marat Giri joined the Russian service to Tsar Fyodor Ivanovich. Much earlier, in 1478th year, even a difficult Tsarevich, but the dethroned Crimean Khan Nerdolet Gire, got into the Russian service. He served, presumably, not bad, because he received a rather large inheritance from the Moscow Grand Duke. The fate of one of these migrants, Tsarevich Shigali, is a ready-made plot for a plump adventure novel. Judge for yourself. He left Astrakhan for Russian service. Then, he was elevated by the Grand Duke of Moscow Vasily III to the Kazan throne, overthrown by the Procrimia party, after which 
without any angelic meekness, having received troops from the Russians. He began diligently to ravage the Kazan lands. Well, a person can be understood. It's a damn shame when you're dethroned from a pretty significant throne. Having seized part of these lands, he built the city of Vesilsursk on them and handed it over to the Russians. In 1531st year, Kashira and Serpakov took possession, but then a black cat ran between him and the Grand Duke. As the Russian chroniclers write, Shigali was guilty before the sovereign, with his proud mind and crafty craft. What exactly was discussed is unknown and will never be known, but Shigali was sent into exile to Baluzero. He didn't stay there long. In 1535th year, he was released by the Grand Duchess of Moscow, Elena Glinskaya. After the death of her husband Vasily III, the ruler of Muscovy, because of the infancy of her son Vanechka, the future Ivan the Terrible, the princess did not lose. From Shigali on freedom, only benefits turned out. In 1539th year, he led the Russian army, defeated the Kazan army near Kostroma, and again, with the support of Moscow, became the Kazan Tsar. But a conspiracy was formed against him, they wanted to kill him and Shigali miraculously escaped at the last minute. After that, he participated in the Russian campaign on Kazan 1547th year, and the construction of the fortress city of Sviazk 1551st year, awarded a gold medal. There was such a reward for military valor in the form of either a medal or a kind of coin, worn according to some sources, on the chest, according to others, on the cap. Russian Russians once again put him on the Kazan throne, freeing 60,000 Russian prisoners. And again, the Kazan nobility conspired against him. But this time Shagali did not run away, but arranged a luxurious feast, inviting the conspirators to it, and his guards killed 70 dear guests right at the table. He did not want to personally hand over Kazan to the Russians, but promised in secret correspondence with Ivan the Terrible that they would destroy the city's defenses and then let Ivan take Kazan himself. The enterprise failed, most likely, because of the opposition of the Kazan nobles and Shigals. In 1522nd year, he himself at his own will, left the Kazan throne and went to Sviast. He ended his days as the Kasimov Tsar. How do you like the biography? Here, by the way, about the Kasimov kingdom, the most interesting public education. Tatar possession as part of the Moscow state. In 1453rd year, Vasily II Dark granted Tsarevich Kasim lands on the left bank of the Oko for his help in the war with the pretender to the Moscow throne, Prince Dmitry Shimyako. Ruined during the civil strife, the Meshursky town was rebuilt, called Kasimov, and these lands became known as the Kasimov Kingdom, which existed for more than 200 years. It should be noted, that the Kasimov Tsars have always been the most loyal vassals of Moscow. The Kasimov Tatars were the first to respond to Minin and Pazarsky's call to gather troops against the Poles. And the false Dmitri II was killed by the Kasimov nobleman Pyotr Yurasev. But, let's go back to Crimea. The matter was not limited to the tolerance of the Tatars there, to the Russians. Several times Moscow and Crimea concluded military alliances. In 1421st year, the Crimean's allies of Grand Duke Vasily marched on Kazan. A little later, the Crimean detachments helped the prince in the fight against the same Shimyek. In turn, in 1491st year, Russian troops appear in the Crimea to help the then Khan Mengligeri in the fight against his separatists. The main danger was not even in them. A large army of Akhmatova's children moved to the Crimea. Kins of the Great Horde Grand Duke Ivan III hastened to help his old ally. The campaign of 1491 was a very large-scale enterprise. Not only Ivan's troops moved into battle, but also his vassal brothers, and served their Tatar princes and a detachment of Kazan Tatars. According to some reports, there were even guns, a military novelty of that time. There was no battle. The rather big army sent by Moscow simply blocked the way to Akhmatovsky at the very Perikop, and those, having estimated the balance of forces and reasonably fearing defeat, retreated. In 1499th year, Moscow and Crimea jointly go on a campaign to Lithuania, and a little later to Poland. As we can see, we were talking about a long military alliance, which, alas, lasted only during Mengeljeri's lifetime. His successor Chess Kettlebell at first tried to adhere to the line of his predecessor, but in the Crimea, 
as we remember, the Turks have already settled, and to the architect of the new Crimea, Mehmed, Moscow's allied relations with the Crimeankans have long stood across the Muslim soul. He, as we remember, had his own goals. Chess was overthrown, fled to Lithuania. There he ended up behind bars and somehow died very quickly for unknown reasons. And his entourage, who were detained in various Lithuanian cities, also suddenly hurried to die prematurely, all of them. Either it was pure Lithuanian amateur activity, or Mehmed's hands turned out to be long. That's it, the end, that is, a complete and final break. After 1506 year, there will never be a shadow between Moscow and Crimea, let alone allied, but simply good neighborly relations. Now the irreconcilability that has raged for almost 300 years is breaking out. The Crimeankans deny the right of the Moscow Tsar to the title of autocrat, Moscow ambassadors at the Crimean court are insulted and humiliated in every possible way. The ruling circles of the Crimea, led by the Khan, put forward the idea of the complete subordination of the Moscow kingdom to the Tatars, that is, they want to return the times of Bachu and his successors. At the beginning of the 16th century, the idea is of course, already a pipe dream, but the Tatars take it extremely seriously. Without any doubt, this idea is actively supported by the Turks. Turkey of that time was the Ataman Empire, the great port, in those years. It was not even at the zenith of its power only on the rise. But she still understands perfectly well that Istanbul does not have, so to speak, the technical capabilities to send troops large enough to conquer the Muscovite kingdom to Russia. However, the Crimeankans are at hand, now obedient puppets of Istanbul and an endless series of invasions of the Crimean Tatars on Russian lands begins. Paradoxically, it made it easier for the Tatars to expand the Moscow state. At first, it was much more profitable for the Crimeans to attack the possession of the Polish king and the Grand Duke of Lithuania, which were much closer to the Crimea than the Russian lands. However, in 1503 year, a significant part of the deeper left bank, as well as southern cities on the border with the steppe, moved to Moscow, Pudel and Rils. Now it was much closer to Moscow Virus. A series of real wars followed, which went on with varying success and sometimes with the direct participation of Turkish troops. A detailed account of this requires a separate book, so I will mention only the biggest success of the Crimean Tatars. In the campaign against Moscow, their troops led by Khan Devlet Gire himself, which took place in 1571st year. The Tatar strike, which was more terrible for Russians, did not happen either before or after. Devlet Gire, in addition to his own troops, also attracted the military force of the large and small Nogali hordes, and Circassian detachments in addition. The situation was complicated by the fact that the main forces of the Moscow army were far away, near Drevel. At that time, the Russian-Livonian War was raging with might and main. Those troops that were available at hand to the Tatars were inferior in number several times. Ivan the Terrible himself came out to meet the Khan with three regiments of Oprichniks. But seeing that the forces were catastrophically unequal, he ordered them to retreat to Moscow, having every reason to fear encirclement and the complete death of Russian soldiers. The Tatars followed the retreating ones and set Moscow on fire. The city burned down almost to the ground. There were fires in the Kremlin as well. After that, a couple of battles took place near the capital, unsuccessful for the Russians. Only Voivod Voratinsky's regiment suffered the least losses and pursued the Crimeans throughout their return journey to the Crimea. However, as it is easy to understand, he could not inflict any significant damage to the enemy many times outnumbered. The Crimean ambassador boasted later in Lithuania that during this campaign, the Tatars killed 60,000 people in Russia and took about the same number captive. Quite possibly, he wasn't exaggerating much. It is known that the Tatars completely ruined 36 cities. A huge number of residents died in Moscow. It burned down so that the capital was then cleared of burnt logs and other debris for two months. Inspired by the victory, it must be recognized as a significant success of the Tatar Khan Devlet Gire suffered. His attack on Moscow was still not a conquest, but a raid. Perhaps the largest of all Tatar raids. And now, 
The Khan was talking in full voice about the conquest. In July of the following 1572nd year, Devlet Giray again moved to Moscow, again in the company of detachments of the big and small Nogali hordes and Circassians. In addition, he also took guns, which he did not have in the last campaign. The Tatars themselves understood no more about artillery than they did about trigonometry. The guns were Turkish, with Turkish topchik, that is, gunners. Before the campaign, Devlet Gire publicly announced his, so to speak, ideological program. He declared that he was going to Moscow to the kingdom, that he would arrange everything there as if he were Beatty, and, not limiting himself to this, he distributed Russian cities and counties among his own or noble Mirzas in advance, which the Mirzas undoubtedly liked very much. Khan must have never heard two Russian sayings, don't brag, go to the army, and don't share the skin of an unkillable bear. And either he forgot, or he didn't know at all, that 190 years ago, the ill-fated Khan Mamai put forward almost the same program when going on a campaign to conquer Russia and sit on Russian bread. The program was, well, grandiose, but Mamai finished badly. This time, the Russians were well prepared to repel the enemy. Palisades were set up along the Oka, ditches were dug, an insurmountable obstacle for the cavalry. By that time, between the two invasions of Devlet Gire, Ivan the Terrible had gathered in Moscow, a large meeting of the then border guards. Voivodes of border fortresses, village heads, heads of guard posts of villages. In general, many military leaders who served on the border. Very quickly, for the first time in Russia, a real charter of the border guard service was developed, called, of course, in the style of that time, the Boyar verdict on the Stanitsa and the guard service. The number of guard villages was increased several times, so that they stretched along the entire border. Each village spent two weeks on patrol, and went to the rear, only after waiting for a shift. For the first time in the history of the Russian border troops, the most real border outfits appeared. Along the border, two mounted patrollers with spare horses traveled almost continuously, with breaks for food. The voivodes were strictly ordered to take care that the patrol horses were kind and each patrol had a clockwork horse, that is, a spare one. The watchmen themselves were instructed, do not make camps for them and put the lights in more than one place. If you cook porridge and then do not put fire in one place twice. And in which place someone spent half a day, in that place not to spend the night, and who spent the night where, and in that place not to enter half a day. In short, everything was provided so that the enemy would not find the patrollers constantly changing their halts. Having discovered the approach of the enemy, the Stanichniki immediately had to send a messenger to the governor, and they themselves watched the enemy, determining his strength, intentions, and possible routes of movement. Everything was thought out very carefully, and played a huge role. The appearance of the Devlet Gire horde became known in advance, and the Russian regiments reached the southern border. There were about three times fewer of them than the Tatars. The Livonian War continued, diverting significant forces. But now, everything was prepared much better than last year. Frankly speaking, nothing was prepared at all last year. The main Russian forces were located in Kolumna, a well-fortified fortress on the Oko. Gulyoigorod was also built there. A kind of small wooden fortress, inside which there were not only archers with squeakers, but also cannons. This structure got its name for a reason. It was not chained to one place, but was equipped with wheels, and it could be transported from place to place. Tatar cavalry appeared and tried to cross the Oka at the so-called Senkin Ford above Serpikov, but was repulsed. The Khan had already gone to the Serpikov crossings, where there were fords, along which it was very easy for a horse to cross to this shore. However, in that place there was already a city, transported there in advance by Gulia, affably bristling with squeaking and cannon barrels. The Tatars were not missed here either. At night, Divlet Gire returned to Senka's ford, and crushed a small detachment of the noble militia defending him with a fierce attack. The horde nevertheless crossed to the other side, and, without delay, moved to Moscow 
fortified much better than last year. It seemed that last year's horrors would repeat, but it helped the Russians that they did not allow the slightest confusion. The Russian regiments rushed in pursuit. 45 versts from Moscow, the advanced regiment of Voivod Vorostinin overtook the Tatar rearguard, commanded by the Khan's sons, and smashed it on its head. The surviving sons began to advise Daddy to turn back, saying, if the Russians beat them here, they probably have troops near Moscow. However, Devlet Gire did not agree, apparently remembering last year's success and believing that difficulties temporary. He led the main forces along the same route to Moscow and gave his sons a 12,000 horse detachment and ordered them to break up the disheveled Russian alergard. This detachment significantly outnumbered the advanced regiment of Korosinin and Voevo got tired of retreating. The Tatars joyfully rushed after them, not suspecting that the retreat was actually a well-calculated maneuver. With this maneuver, Kforosostinin brought the enemy right under the cannon fire of the walking city. Having lost a lot of people, the Tatars hastily retreated. Now, having learned about this defeat, Devlet Gire led his army not to Moscow, but for Moscow. It was too dangerous to besiege a well-fortified city with a 20,000 Russian army in the rear. Khan decided to break it first, and then to deal with the Russian capital without hindrance. The general battle, as the main and decisive battle was later called, took place a day later in the town of Melody. Devlet Gire for some reason stood on the Pakra River for a whole day, and the Russians managed to strengthen themselves well during this time. On the hill, Gulyoi was assembled, a city in which there was enough space for both a large regiment and cannons. The rest of the Russian regiments were located on the flanks and from the rear. The battle lasted all day. The defenders, walking around the city, against which the main Udarkin was directed, fired accurately, and the flanks grappled with the Tatars. The Tatars did not just suffer great losses. The commander-in-chief of the Crimean horde, Divi Mirza, was captured. Khan stopped his attacks, but did not retreat. After giving the army two days of respite, he again began to attack Gulyagorod with window and foot detachments. The attacks continued all day, but without success. By evening, Seeing that the Tatars were definitely giving up, the Russians staged a sortie. Voivod Voratinsky and his soldiers, unnoticed by the Tatars, came out of Gulyoigorod and struck from the rear and Vorostinin, after a volley from all the guns, struck in the forehead. The Tatars could not stand the attacks from both sides and ran. The defeat was crushing. Huge losses among the Tatars. Many notable Tatar and Nogoi Morsi were captured. The son and grandson of Devlet Gire were killed. The Crimeankins never tried to conquer Moscow again, but even to cut off a piece of Russian lands. However, this did not mean that the Crimeans calmed down. They simply changed tactics. From purely military campaigns, they switched to predatory raids. Historians will not be able to determine the exact number of them, but there were a great many raids. Sometimes up to 20,000 steppe dwellers participated in the raids, Sometimes a much smaller force organized a raid, so to speak, its own private one, some Mirza or Bey. At the same time, he was not going to be interested in Khan's consent. The situation in Crimea somewhat resembled the riotous license of the Polish gentry. Every noble nobleman who had a military detachment went for loot when he wanted and where he wanted, to Russia, to the Ukrainian lands, to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Others, the most impudent, got to Moldova. As the Russian ambassadors reported to Moscow, everyone in the Crimea is sovereign. The Khan concluded peace treaties with Moscow several times, but the nobility did not care about it and continued their private raids. The raiders burned villages and towns, crops, robbed what they could, stole horses and cattle. But the main goal has always been people who could be profitably sold in the Crimea on slave markets. Two young children, the elderly and just the elderly were not taken, realizing that they would not survive the flight. The essence of the raid was precisely to fly in lightning fast and unexpectedly, to rob quickly, to catch people quickly, and to flee with all possible speed so as not to be intercepted by Russian troops. Sometimes the Russians still managed it. So we tried to grab those who are younger and stronger. But special attention was paid to beautiful girls and young women.
In the main slave market, in a cafe, the average price of a man was from 10 to 20 gold, but for young beauties they paid much more. If there was time, they did not miss the opportunity to amuse themselves. Girls and women in the queue were raped right there, in front of their fathers and husbands. However, other leaders of the detachments forbade their people to play pranks with girls. But not out of humanity, but out of a simple commercial calculation. Virgins were the most expensive item on the market. It is only possible to calculate approximately how many Russian people were hijacked in Poland. The exact figures will remain unknown. According to the calculations of the historian Novoselsky, only in the first half of the 17th century, up to 200,000 people were taken to Poland by the Tatars and their feet. But the raids of the people stealers took place both before and after that time. Some South Russian regions were completely depopulated. It got to the point that the Persian Shah Abbas, in a conversation with the Russian ambassadors, was sincerely surprised that there were still residents in Russia. In Russia, a special tax was eventually introduced for the redemption of Polonianics. Some were indeed able to be redeemed, but only a small part. For the most part, the Polonians, especially the Poinki, remained in eternal slavery. Some of the prisoners settled in the Crimea from the captured Mers and Bays. Men were waiting for the fate of eternal workers, where they would not have to. The Crimean Tatars themselves despised all work and considered it humiliating for themselves. The girls got the role of sex toys. But the bulk of the prisoners went to the foreign market, mainly to Turkey. So many Slavonic slaves were sold there that at one time, there was even a saying in Turkey that a Turk speaks Turkish only with his superiors. He speaks Arabic with his smolo, Russian with his mother, Ukrainian with his grandmother. In fact, given the scale of the slave trade with Turkey, it would not be an exaggeration to say that some part of Slavic blood flows in the veins of modern Turks. Part of the Poland was sold to Europe. Aha, that's it my dear sir. Christian Europeans calmly bought Christian slaves. All the same, they were Orthodox, and therefore, from the point of view of future civilized Europeans, as if they were not Christians at all. The Slavs fell mainly in the Italian states, but sometimes in France. There, the same unenviable fate awaited them. Men became disenfranchised semi-slaves, women servants concubines. By the way, the Basarmans, that is, the Muslims, were categorically forbidden to sell their co-religionists into slavery. Sometimes the most incredible incidents happened. The famous Roxolana, a beauty from the Ukrainian lands, was sold to Turkey, got into the harem of Sultan Suleiman II. At first, she was one of the many ordinary tribal concubines, but she turned out to be so smart and resourceful that in the end, she became the legitimate wife of the Sultan. It was allowed to have a great many concubines of the Sultan, but only one was supposed to have a legitimate spouse. But this, of course, is an enchanting exception, a single piece. The slave trade, in fact, was the basis of the economy of the Crimean Khanate. The basis of the economy at that time was nomadic cattle breeding. There were enough areas where it was possible, as subsequent history will show, to successfully develop agriculture and viticulture. But, as already mentioned, the Tatars did not want to work and kept mainly on imported bread, which of course required a lot of money, and it was easiest to get them from the point of view of the Tatars by slave trade. That's why they staged constant raids on Slavic neighbors, that's why they engaged in a uniform racket, extorting gifts and commemorations from neighbors, that is, calling things by their proper names tribute, 